Hello and welcome back. We are now on to unit six, the second to last uh, unit, who would have thought? Uh, and we just finished the unit on the sacraments of healing. And now we're moving into the last category of sacraments, the sacraments of service or the sacraments of communion in service or at service to the church. Uh, and these two sacraments of holy orders and matrimony are going to look at two different lifestyles in which someone can try to live a holy life. That through either being ordained or through marriage and a family, that an individual can come to live out God's ultimate calling of holiness, of reaching uh, perfect union with him in heaven. The last module in this unit is actually going to focus more on that sense of vocation and calling and how we might discern that and live that out. But first, we're going to start by looking at what these two callings are. They're not the only callings in the church, uh, but what these two callings are as sacraments um, to be able to better understand them before we understand how to discern them. So we're going to start with holy orders and looking today in kind of an all-inclusive snapshot in one in one go of what we were calling holy orders, what happens at the sacrament of holy orders, and how it affects those who receive it. So let's first start by looking at what we recall in the sacrament of holy orders. So ultimately, the sacrament of holy orders is going to configure those who receive it to be closer like Christ. So we're all called to be Christ-like. In a specific way, when God knew that we needed to touch, feel, see, and hear, after Jesus ascended into heaven, knew in a specific way to leave individuals to be his, his very visible and literal representatives on earth, especially in a, a leadership and service capacity. And so from here we have this ordained priesthood. And we see that throughout scripture, especially in the Old Testament, there's a sense of, of individuals being set apart for this ministry of being this idea of priests, of giving offerings and sacrifices. So in being configured to Christ, the priests and also deacons and, and bishops who are also part of this sacrament are going to be configured to Christ like the head. So remember the, body, the church is the body of Christ. We are the body. Christ is the head. So too, priests, bishops, deacons are going to be seen as this leadership in the church to help guide the people of God. That ultimately in any large grouping of individuals that there have to be some kind of sense of leadership. But also to be configured closer to Christ as the high priest. Remember Jesus is high priest. He gave his body as a sacrifice for the world on the cross. So too will priests offer up sacrifice in the sacraments and in the Eucharist, but also the sacrifice of their lives on behalf of the people. And lastly, Jesus is a mediator of grace. So he was the bridge between heaven and earth that allowed us to receive God's life force, his grace. So too, the priests, by offering the sacraments, will be able to help us receive and channel God's grace from the cross. As I mentioned a little bit before, it's going to recall in the Old Testament this idea of the priestly class or the Levitical priesthood. So the Levitical priesthood was responsible for offering up offerings, quite literally, of different kinds on behalf of the people to God. And so too the priests today make an offering, bring our offering up to God and pray that it is made holy. We also spoke of in the modules on the Eucharist that the Eucharist is prefigured by the offering of Melchizedek, who made an offering uh, to God at Thanksgiving. So in seeing that his offering prefigures the Eucharist, the person of Melchizedek is also going to prefigure the priesthood. Later in the New Testament, Jesus is going to call the 12 apostles into a new unique leadership role. He's going to call them and mentor them. And later after he ascends into heaven, we're going to see very clearly in Acts that the apostles are leading the community with Peter as their spokesperson. So we see this hierarchy develop of sorts. Uh, and from there is where we get this sense of hierarchy today, this idea of the apostles, the overseers, the first bishops leading the church. And, and uh, Peter as the spokesperson for the apostles, the first among many, from which his role later develops this understanding of the papacy as this central unifying uh, symbol in person. We also see throughout scripture, Jesus gives different commands. And we've already spoken about some of these here or there in the different modules, but just to summarize it here, uh, in the module on reconciliation, we talk about the idea of binding and unbinding, forgiving and, 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 and retaining, for example. Uh, this idea of healing and touch and anointing of the sick. This idea of do some memory of me in the Eucharist. The idea of go out and proclaim the gospel. Go out and uh, baptize. So all these commands that Jesus gave, he gave first to the apostles. So he's giving all these not only abilities, but these responsibilities to these individuals in leading the church. Likewise, the apostles realized that 
they weren't going to be here forever, so they needed to leave people in their place just like Jesus left individuals in his place. So we see the very first ordination in, in the first chapter of Acts, where uh, Judas had taken his own life, and so the apostles thought it was important to keep the number 12. Uh, so they, they chose between two individuals uh, in their community that were upstanding and holy and with them from the very beginning. They prayed to God, cast lots, and it fell upon Matthias. And so they ordained him by laying hands on him and praying for the Holy Spirit to come down upon him. And so the same practice is held today a new ordination ritual of laying on of hands and praying for the imparting of the Holy Spirit. And then this tradition developed where these apostles would ordain, choose, uh, and pray upon other individuals to continue this ministry as Christianity grew and to take their place. And from this, we get this idea of apostolic succession uh, to continue the apostles' ministry um, later on in, in the church till the modern day. So from that development in the early church, we say, see these three different orders, or I would call the degrees of holy orders, that kind of develop in the early church. So the first order is the order of, of bishop uh, in the Greek episkopos, and these were the apostles and their successors. And the word episkopos comes from the word overseer, so they would oversee the whole church, commun uh, the whole church community. Well, what happens when the church starts to grow, Christianity starts to grow, and these pockets of Christianity develop around the Mediterranean, and there isn't always an overseer or an apostle that can be there. Well, these presbyters, or presbyteros, meaning elders, would emerge within the church uh, and, and guide and lead and oversee that local community. Uh, the priest was actually the last order to develop. Bishops and deacons came first, um, but we're just going in terms of, of orders, what we might think of today in terms of holy orders uh, next on the line, was that the role of the presbyter was really to oversee that local church. And they worked as really as an extension of the overseer, of the bishop, of the apostle. Uh, and of course, today, we know priests as overseeing the local community, the parish church, while the bishop oversees the larger church we may call a diocese, uh, which is a geographical area where he oversees the churches in that area. So really, a priest only functions in as much as he's under a bishop. A priest cannot be a priest aside from a bishop because the priest gets their abilities, or what we call their faculties, for administering the sacraments and serving as a priest from their local bishop. So really the bishop is the leader of each local church and the priest just helps them do that job because he can't be at every church at once. Then we have the deacon or the Greek diakonos, meaning to serve. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, the role of the deacon actually came and developed before the role of the priest in Acts, where their role was specifically to take care of the poor in the widows to make sure everyone was given the same amount uh, in, in, of what they needed, that some individuals weren't overlooked over others. Uh, and so the role of the deacon is really uh, grounded in service to the poor and to the needy. Uh, over time, it developed into simply a stage leading up to the priesthood, what we call the transitional priesthood, and it kind of lost a sense of its call to service and really just became a transitional stage on the road to ordination. After the Second Vatican Council, the idea of the permanent diaconate was renewed. This idea of individuals who are married, and after they're married might be ordained a permanent deacon, so they can't become a priest, but become a deacon and focus on service to the church. And their ministry is both helping in the church and, and assist, assisting the priest, but also a lot of times serving in nursing homes and in hospitals as chaplains. So these are the three orders of holy orders. Now, if you notice uh, the... the um, the sacrament of holy orders reserved to baptized males. This is by no way saying that uh, females or women are, are less than men, but in fact it's recognizing that both have equal dignity uh, and both have a differentiation that, that are called to serve in different ways because they're in many ways different, um, but in no means less equal in dignity. And that's one thing that the Catechism very much um, accentuates, is that each individual has a role in the church, that women are very much needed in the church. And we see that also not only with families, but also with, the, with women religious. Uh, we see especially today Pope Francis calling women to higher uh, positions within the church, overseeing even certain offices within the Vatican. And so that differentiation is very essential. There's a certain wisdom, there's a certain giftedness that we have to respect in one another, whether we're male or female, uh, that we have uh, different gifts that are needed within the church. 
and that the priesthood is not the end-all, be-all, while it is certainly important, uh, certainly simply the priesthood is not the only order uh, that is needed in the church, is not the only role of service that is needed in the church. There are very much other roles that need to be fulfilled as well. Ultimately, uh, the church's call for only baptized male it comes from, from Christ. This idea that Jesus called 12, 12 men to be apostles. Why? We can speculate. Uh, and, and that might be a question reserved for, for Christ himself. But ultimately, that is where the, the rooting of this, of why uh, these individuals are called are. So let's look at the celebration, the ritual of the sacrament of holy orders. So ultimately, the ordinary minister of the sacrament is a bishop. A priest cannot ordain, a deacon cannot ordain, only a bishop, because the bishop has the fullness of holy orders, has received the fullness of the sacrament. So more often than not, almost always, I don't think I've ever seen of an instance where it's not, uh, holy orders is celebrated during Mass. And this is the case for priests, deacons, and bishops. So holy orders uh, has a different ritual depending on whether it's a priest, a deacon, or a bishop uh, being ordained. Uh, they have a lot of similarities, a couple differences. So we're going to mainly look at the ordination of a priest, but a lot of this is going to be similar throughout. So during the Mass, after the, the Liturgy of the Word, or after the readings, uh, the priest or the candidate will be called for to make a promise of obedience to the bishop. So priests uh, take two vows, a vow of obedience to their bishop, that they will obey what their bishop asks of them, and a vow of celibacy, which is essentially a vow of refraining from any sexual intimacy or relationships. This is different than chastity. Chastity is a vow of really more self-control and not using another person, which individuals in marriage are also called to. But this is a, a vow of, of refraining from that. Uh, this is a discipline, so it, it is something that the church imposes on, on its priests in the West, or, or something that asks of its priests, rather. Uh, in the Eastern Catholic churches, priests are allowed to marry, bishops are not. Uh, so this is uh, something that is asked of priests, really so that they can focus in on the church. They're seen as being married, married to the church, married to Christ. Uh, and so they can fully dedicate their time and their effort uh, to serving the church, uh, apart from the demands that a family can give, which I can surely share with you, there are a lot of demands of having a family gives as well. Um, they can focus in on, on the church. Some people may wonder, you know, is, is being a priest lonely? You know, I'm afraid of maybe discerning the priesthood because I don't want to be alone. Well, loneliness can occur anywhere. You can be married and be lonely and feel forgotten. That is that's certainly true. Maybe you've been in a relationship where you felt lonely and, and maybe neglected. Um, but that's certainly not the case. The priest is surrounded by many individuals, is always in a sense of community, uh, and is in many ways a spiritual uh, spiritual father. Uh, so at least for the priests that I've spoken to about it, they definitely don't see it as a, as a sense of loneliness, but rather as a way of kind of focusing in on, on, on their, their service and to configure to Christ who was not married as well. Uh, for diocesan priests, so priests that serve your local parish church in a diocese, they only take two vows, vow of obedience and a vow of celibacy. Uh, those who might be part of different religious orders, religious orders being these different communities of, of men or women, of nuns or monks or friars or sisters who live together in a certain way of life and a certain uh, charism and, and uh, mission, service, they may also take a vow of poverty. So any money they take in, they share together as a community. Diocesan priests don't take that vow. And the vow of celibacy is implicit. It's not expressed in the ritual, but at the very least they take a vow of obedience. And so do, do deacons. Uh, permanent deacons do not take a vow of celibacy because oftentimes they're already married. But transitional deacons do because they will become one day priests. After this, the priests or deacons will prostrate themselves, lay themselves down on the ground, sign of humility, and the litany of saints will be prayed. So we're calling down the intercession of our different family members in heaven, the saints, to pray that these individuals be made worthy and strengthened for this ministry. Next, the bishop will lay hands on the head of the person being ordained, similar to Acts, as what we just saw, a sign of imparting the Holy Spirit. And this is going to be part of the matter of the sacrament. And after the bishop lays hands on, on the candidate, all the other priests that are there will then come around and will also lay their hands to pray that the Holy Spirit may come upon this individual. Next, we come to the form in the rest of the matter. 
uh, which is the prayer of consecration. It's a lengthy prayer, which is essentially going to recall the memorial of the sacrament of holy orders. Everything from Melchizedek to the Levitical priesthood to Jesus' ministry to the apostles. And it's going to be a prayer praying that this person be made holy. To consecrate is to make something holy. It's what the Latin means, con, with, sacra, holy, to make holy with holiness. And so this prayer is ultimately what's going to consecrate or ordain this individual. Next, they're going to take a uh, sacred chrism, remember, sign of being chosen, used in confirmation and, and uh, baptism. And it's the priest's hands are going to be anointed with the sacred chrism because their hands are going to do the work of Christ. And their hands are then wrapped with this towel. And it is usually a tradition that when the priest's mother passes away, that she's buried uh, with this little towel that it st will have the sweet smell of chrism as a sign that she gave the church uh, a priest, uh, uh, an ordained minister of the church. Lastly, in the kind of the main part of the ordination, uh, they take the chalice and the patent, so the, the cup and, and the plate, if you will, for layman's term, that will have the host on it and, and water and wine in the chalice, and they will give it to the priest in his hands. And it's a sign of, through the prayer that the bishop will pray, that the priest will receive the ability to consecrate the Eucharist and minister the sacraments. Next, we have what's called the kiss or sign of peace. This dates from the time of the apostles. It was in what we call the apostolic greeting, where the sign of peace is this sign of unity and oneness, that uh, these individuals are now together with the, uh, the order of, of the priesthood. Lastly, they receive the visible signs of their, of their order. So for deacons, they will receive a stole, uh, which for a deacon stole, it's like a sash almost, if you will, that is, uh, goes from shoulder to, to hip uh, diagonally. For the priest, they'll receive a stole that kind of drapes around their neck and falls on either side. Uh, and both of these stoles are the signs of their authority. So when a deacon wears their stole, it's a sign they're functioning as deacon. When a priest uh, wears their soul, it's a sign of their authority as a priest, that they're functioning as priest. Uh, they, the priest also receives what's called a chasuble, so that kind of that long poncho is poncho type vestment um, that envelops them. It's going to be a sign of Christ's charity because Christ's charity is meant to envelop them and to envelop all of us. Deacons have a similar vestment called a dalmatic that more has some sleeves as opposed to the, the priest style kind of just falls and drapes. The bishop also receives specific signs for their office. They receive what's called a mitre, which is the formal name for their hat, a crozier, which is the formal name of their staff, and a ring, a sign of their authority, kind of like a, a married person receives rings, they will receive a ring as well. And those will be the signs of their Episcopal authority. And after that, usually in the ritual, they'll continue with the liturgy of the Eucharist, and the newly ordained priests or bishops will come celebrate the Mass with, with the other priests and bishops that are there. So how does this affect the individuals who receive it? So similar to confirmation and baptism and the other sacraments that we receive once, it will give that individual a, a um, excuse me, a sacramental character, an indelible mark on their soul that can never be taken away. So they're always consecrated as a priest. Even if they leave the priesthood, which is possible, they can no longer serve or function as a priest. Uh, but even in a in case of extreme, extreme situations, say a plane is, is going down and someone has to hear their confession, they are in that moment of extreme uh, situation still able to hear that confession because they have that sacramental character still on their soul. But it ultimately it's going to help all priests, deacons, and bishops to function in, like Christ in three ways. Christ was a priest, a teacher, and a shepherd, so it's going to help them to be a priest, a teacher, and a shepherd. A priest, as we've mentioned before, it's going to help them to offer their lives as a sacrifice and service to the church day in and day out, and also help them in offering the seven sacraments. As a teacher, it's going to help them to give them the strength, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to be able to proclaim the gospel to others, especially in a world that, that needs it, to be resp that they have a prime responsibility for communing the faith to all of us. We have a responsibility to communicate it as well, but they're going to be in that leadership role, that model of communicating the faith. And lastly, as shepherds, so priests, deacons, and bishops have a role to take care of the church. To uh, They've been entrusted or are stewards of the church 
uh, have been trusted by uh, uh, by Christ to take care of it in his stead. So really, they have a very big responsibility in, in the church, which is a global organization, a global community, uh, with all its, its, its struggles and joys, uh, with all uh, the times and sufferings it might face, that they have a very uh, important role of trying to guide it sometimes through some very difficult some difficult times. So that's why we should always pray for our priests and bishops and deacons uh, that they might have the strength to be able to lay down their lives for, for us and be other-centered. Well, how does it transform these individuals as well? So while it might help individuals to be a priest, teacher, and shepherd, it's also going to help each individual in their own unique way. So a bishop has a certain responsibility. The bishops oversee a diocese. They also work together to oversee the universal church. Uh, working together. So that's a large responsibility. You know, we might think a certain way in the United States. In another country, people might think of a different way. So how do you help people of different cultures, of different locations, have different beliefs, that have different customs, uh, different viewpoints, to come together as one community in Christ? Uh, that takes a lot of effort. That takes a lot of time. That, why, that might be why things to take their time to develop and grow. Um, because to take in consideration the church in Asia, the church in Africa, the church in South America, the church in Europe, the church in North America, it's very different places. So we pray that they might be transformed to be more in Christ and to be able to guide the church, defend the faith, and be a model of others. Bishops have a special responsibility for safeguarding the deposit of faith, the teachings of the church given to us by Christ. So we pray that they also have the guidance to be able to explain and defend the truth. Priests are, are transformed to be Christ in, in a more local level, to guide the local parish, to be the visible person of Christ in, on the local level, and administering the sacraments, offering Eucharist, forgiving sin, anoint, giving anointing of the sick, uh, baptizing, confirming, being there for marriage. It's oftentimes said that what we might go through a lifetime, a priest might go through a day. They might have to say a funeral in a morning, uh, and then uh, a wedding in the afternoon, and say mass later with a baptism, and might experience uh, a lot of different things in one day. So we pray that they may be given the grace to to be there and to um, to have to handle everything that they have to to handle. Lastly, well, deacon is transformed with the grace to perform works of mercy. Uh, again, serving at the local church, but be able to to be that sign of mercy, especially as they serve the poor, the marginalized, the homebound, and the ill in their role as deacon. A lot of times the priesthood might seem as something intimidating of, you know, to give my life up for that. Myself personally, I did consider the priesthood at one point. I ultimately was became married as I discerned that that was ultimately what God was calling me towards. But I always think that everyone owes it to themselves uh, to discern other vocations, that priesthood and marriage is not the only vocations we're going to see. There's also the call to religious life or consecrated life uh, as a nun or brother or sister or monk. The call also to the single life, which is also a very important call in the church of individuals who, by not having a family or not being a priest or religious, have the freedom to go and serve the church and others um, as, as, as they can. Um, we all give up sacrifice. Sometimes individuals, and I know myself, was afraid, you know, am I going to sacrifice a lot as a priest? Well, I can tell you as a married individual, there's a lot that you sacrifice. You know, I can't just get up and, and go wherever I want. I have to, I have a wife, I have a child that I have to put first, that their needs come first, um, that I can't just move uh, to another country. I can't just, you know, go uh, travel whenever I like because I have to have their needs uh, put first. So in the same way, there's going to be sacrifices in any vocation that a person that a person takes. Uh, in a certain way, there are sacrifices that I made as a married individual. I can't I can't consecrate the Eucharist. I, I will never be able to to take that host and to by the power of the Holy Spirit to make presence present the real presence of Christ or to to forgive sins in Christ's names to say to someone I absolve you of your sins and name the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are things I had to sacrifice in being a married individual. So regardless of what vocation you take, there's always going to be a sense of sacrifice. So don't let that dissuade you from considering a different vocation, or if you're considering the priesthood to consider that. We need good priests. We need good and holy religious. Uh, and that takes character. That takes strength. That takes, takes real individuals. Uh, it's not kind of a leftover sacrament. Oh, if you know, if I don't find anyone, I'll become a priest. By no means at all. It is meant for individuals, and God is calling people by name. So this in a whole is the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or, or clarifications made, by all means, feel free to reach out. Uh, 
but I invite you to complete the module materials for this module. And until next time, have a good one.